For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you by being worried can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will He not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, What will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Would you join me as we pray? And now, Father, as we come to Your Word, we ask that You would teach us and instruct us. And we ask, Lord, that Your Spirit, that He would calm our hearts at the foot of the cross. We ask, Lord, that You would draw our attention to Your Son. Help us to understand what He is instructing and teaching us in this portion of Scripture so that our lives may reflect and be obedient to it. Father, help us to engage our eyes and ears and minds and glorify You as we hear from You, from Your Word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thomas Edison once said, As a cure for worry, work is better than whiskey. I think Thomas Edison hinted at something there in that statement that is all too true. For many people, when they grow worry or anxious in life, when anxiety sort of reaches their heart and anxiety reaches their mind, their first inclination is to reach for a drink or to reach for a bottle of pills or to reach for something to help them cope and sort of ignore and numb the experience that they're going through in life. In our increasingly overly medicated society, this is becoming an even uh, more of a problem. Anti-anxiety medications are at an all-time high selling. Doctors are writing more prescriptions of these kind than ever before. Now, granted, there are those that have biological and physiological problems that need medication, and we need to be prudent about that. But clearly, I think it's easy to say that that is the exception and not the rule. And as we come to the text of Jesus this morning, as we listen to His teaching about worry and anxiety, Jesus would teach us this that when anxiety and worry grips our heart, more often than not, it is not the result of a chemical imbalance, but it is the result of a theological imbalance. The point at which you worry, Jesus says, is the point at which you don't trust God. The point at which we find ourselves gripped with fear and anxiety is the point at which there is unbelief within us. 
Jesus is teaching us here that this is an issue of faith, an issue of belief. And that's why right in the middle of this sermon, at the end of verse 30, you remember, he sort of interjects. He's teaching about worry and anxiety and worry and anxiety. And in the end of verse 30, he interjects, Oh, you of little faith. He's pointing back to belief. He's saying that is the core issue. It is not a chemical imbalance. More often than not, it is a theological imbalance. The reason that we have such large anxiety sometimes is because we have such small faith in God. And Jesus challenges us at the very core of our being of our, about our worry and our stress. Jesus teaches us here that the ultimate cure for worry, it's not whiskey, as Edison might have said. It's not work. But the ultimate cure for worry is trust. It is to trust in our God. Now, one of the things that is striking about our text today is how Jesus breaks down this passage, and we're going to break it down in the same way. But notice three times he repeats himself. Look in your Bible at verse 25. Jesus begins by saying, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried. Now, scan down to verse 31. What does he say? Do not worry. And then scan down to verse 34. Again, Jesus says, do not worry. Jesus is trying to make plain here something to us. Jesus three times says, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. But that's not the end of his sermon. And at the risk of only hearing half the sermon, Jesus is not just saying, calm down. He is saying, don't worry, so that you might start trusting. To simply hear the sermon today and think, well, Jesus wants me to chill out, that's not the point. It's not just calm down. He says three times, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, because he's trying to make it clear that if you are worrying, then you are not trusting. If you are filled with worry, then that indicates that you are not filled with trust in God. It's like, it's like breathing. I can inhale. I can exhale. But no matter how hard or fast I try, I can't do them both at the same time. It, you can only be filled with one, right? And Jesus says you're either filled with trust or you're filled with anxiety. And if what you find in your heart is anxiety and worry, then what that indicates is that there's no room for trust. And so Jesus tells us the main idea here, He says, is stop worrying so that you can start trusting God. Stop worrying. Three times he says, so that you can start trusting God. Jesus is not just simply wanting to tell you to, to calm down. He's not just trying to remove this sort of unhealthy, uh, this unbiblical thing, this worry. He wants to remove the unhealthy thing, the unbiblical thing, and to replace it with a biblical thing. Get rid of the worry so that you can make room for the trust, he said. Don't worry. Stop worrying so that you can start trusting. The book of Proverbs tells us in Proverbs chapter 12 that anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down. There are some of you here this morning, your heart, let's be honest, is weighed down. There is anxiety in your heart. There is worry about the future. And Jesus is telling us this morning that, listen, if your heart is filled with anxiety about work, it's filled with anxiety about a relationship, it's filled with worry about money or these other things, then your heart is not filled with trust. It's one or the other. And Jesus says, stop worrying so that you can now start trusting. What's so beautiful about what Jesus does here in this text is rather than focusing our attention, is saying, ah, just look at how small your worries are. If you follow the logic of Jesus here and what He is teaching us, He doesn't say, oh, stop worrying because your worries are small. He says, stop worrying because your God is big. Look at what He can do for birds and for grass. And in and, and all of time, look what He can do. Stop worrying. That is unbelief. 
Don't be a little faithed person. Be a big faithed person who trusts in what our God is capable of. I don't know where your heart is filled with anxiety and worry, but I think it's pretty safe to say that most of us from time to time are tempted in these things. And Jesus says it's not a chemical imbalance, it is a theological one. So fix your eyes upon God and your worries will shrink in time as you see who God is. Jesus tells us to fix our eyes upon God. Now, we're going to break this passage down in the same way that Jesus does. He gives us three commands. Do not worry, do not worry, do not worry. And he is telling us and instructing us instead to trust in God. Notice the three things that he tells us here that we need to trust in. First of all, Jesus tells us to trust in God's providence. Don't worry. Stop worrying, he says, so that you can trust in God's providence. This is verses 25 here through verse 30. Now, the word providence is a big word, right? One of those $5 words that you use in school. But the word providence, you may want to write this on your page, it just simply means the ability to provide. The ability to provide. Trust in God's ability to provide. Now notice how Jesus begins in verse 25. For this reason I say to you. If you have any other translation that you're reading this morning, it uses the word therefore. Therefore I say to you. Anytime in the Bible you see the word therefore, guess what? You go back and see what it's there for. Because it is there for a reason. Therefore is a linking word. It says... Jesus says something here, therefore something else. If you want to understand the something else, you've got to go back and see what the something is. So you remember last week, Jesus says, for this reason I say to you, what is the reason? Last week we saw Jesus gives us the reason. He says the foundation here of this sort of practical thing, this stopping of worrying, this trusting in God, the foundation of it is built upon what our priorities and pursuits are in life. He just said in last week's message, in the previous verses, verses 19 through 24, Jesus said, you have one of two choices. You can either store up heavenly treasures or earthly ones. You can either set your sights upon light or upon darkness. You can set your affections on God or wealth, but Jesus says you cannot do both at the same time. And so Jesus says to us, You have this choice between light and darkness, between God and wealth, between heaven and earth. And if you set your affections on heavenly things, on light things, on God things, if you set your affections there, then what you have done is rejected earthly things. So guess what? You don't have to worry about them. Because God will provide for you. For this reason. So the rest of this text we're going to look at today is not going to make sense unless you get what Jesus has just said. You have to first make the choice to pursue heavenly things, to set your sights upon light, and to serve God and not well. Jesus says here, for this reason, based upon this choice, I say this to you. Notice he says, do not be Worry. It's a present tense verb here. In other words, it could also be translated, stop worrying right now. Jesus knew the hearts of those standing in front of him, and he says to them, stop worrying, break the habit in your life. You know, very often we have sort of can become just uh, sort of convinced by our society, whether consciously or subconsciously, and we just sort of assume things. Well, you know, I'm just a worry wart, we say. That's who I am. I'm just a worrier. I can't help it. It's it's in my blood. And Jesus says, no, no, no. You can help it. So stop it. Do not be worried. It's not a DNA thing. It's a theology thing. Trust in God. Set your belief and your faith and your hope in God and not in yourself. Now notice what he says. Do not be worried about your Life. And then he goes on to mention three things. What does he say there? As to what you will eat, as to what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on it. Jesus mentioned here the, the, the trinity of earthly obsessions. Food, drink, and clothes. 
Now, I think one of the most important things for us, particularly in living where we do and, and living how we do, is to really put this passage in perspective. Because let's be honest, here Jesus is talking to fishermen and peasants and, and farmers, and he says to them, don't be worried about food and drink and clothing. This is a society where when it came dinner time, they didn't have fridges, they didn't have giant cupboards. Every day they would literally go to the market to buy their food. And so every day it was reliance upon, am I going to have enough money in my pockets to buy food? And Jesus tells those people in that environment, don't worry about food and drink and clothing. Don't make them your greatest pursuit in life. Now here's my point here. Let's put this all into perspective. They were worrying, am I going to eat? We spend our time worrying what? What am I going to eat? For us, it's not a question of, will I have shoes to wear? It's which of the 12 pairs of shoes do I put on? It's not, will I have nice clothes to put on? It's which of my suits and which of my ties or whatever it might be. So put this into perspective. If Jesus says to peasants and farmers and fishermen, to the lowest of income people, don't worry about food and drink and clothing. God knows that you need them. If Jesus says, don't worry about these essential things, how much more ridiculous is it for us to worry about non-essential things? There are some people in this world who, who, who don't know where their next meal is coming from, and we get bent out of shape because we have to sit in traffic for five minutes. We get upset because our Facebook page won't load. My cell phone reception's not good. I mean, the, the list goes on and on. And, and I think that's a point we have to hear this morning. If Jesus says, don't worry about essential things, how much more silly and ridiculous is it for us to worry about even things that are further removed? Jesus says, don't worry about these essential things. Your Father knows what you need. Put your life into perspective. Stop getting bit out of shape over cell phones and traffic and your computer. Remember, you have food and clothing and drink. Be content. He goes and finishes that section with, by asking, Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Now this is a rhetorical question that has an obvious answer. What is the answer? Sure, life is more than food. The body is more than clothing. But that answer is becoming less and less clear, even though it's supposed to be obvious, less and less clear in our world because our culture today and the, the movement of society, particularly American culture, is increasingly evolutionary. And so what we're being taught is this sort of reductionistic understanding of life that I'm just an evolved animal, so there is no God, there is no heaven, there are no heavenly things, so all that you see is what you get. So yes, life is food and clothing and drink. It is the inherent conclusion, the reductionistic conclusion of an increasingly evolutionary society. And Jesus says, don't, don't get swept into that. Life is more than food. It is more than clothing. It is more than drink. And if your Father can give you the greater things, life and a body, if He can give you the greater things, how much more can He give you the lesser things? The food to put in the body. The clothes to put on the body. Jesus says, don't, don't, don't buy into these things. Life is more than this, and God knows it, and you should know it too. Now, to teach us about the sort of needlessness of anxiety and worry, Jesus gives us here three pictures, three anecdotes. He talks about a picture of birds. He then gives us a picture of time. And then thirdly, he gives us a picture of wildflowers or grass. He gives us three pictures to show to us of, of God's ability to provide for birds and God's ability to provide for grass. And he concludes by saying, look, if they can trust in God's providence, you can too. And he helps us to fix our eyes where they need to be. Look at the first picture he gives us, the picture of birds in verse 26. Look. At the birds of the air. By the way, that is a command. You know what Jesus says here? He commands you, become a bird watcher. Take up a new hobby, Jesus says. 
Literally, he says here, fix your eyes upon the birds and watch them. Notice that what? That they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns. When was the last time you saw a bird wearing overalls and a John Deere hat? You ever seen one? You ever seen a bird, you know, uh, riding a tractor across, you know, 40 acres, plowing it up? Of course not. Now that sounds ridiculous to us, and, and it was ridiculous. That's Jesus' point. Birds don't do that. Now, it isn't that birds are lazy. Birds are incredibly busy, incredibly industrious. He, he's not saying here, just, just be a sloth. But he's saying here, don't worry. The birds don't worry about these things. They just go to meal to meal. And yet your Father, he says here, and yet your Heavenly Father feeds them. Now, what's even more striking about this to Jesus' first century hearers is if you go back into the Old Testament, to the book of Leviticus, look at Deuteronomy, there's a section in both of those books, about seven or eight verses long, where he talks about birds. And he mentions that pretty much every bird we can think of is, guess what? Unclean. Eagles and falcons, hawks, vultures, ravens. I mean, he goes down the list and says, this is unclean, this is unclean, this is unclean, this is unclean. In other words, for the Jewish people, don't eat it, don't touch it, don't come near it. It's ceremonially unclean. How much more would this have struck these people? When Jesus says, look at the birds that are in the eyes of the law unclean, and yet, even though they're unclean, God provides for them. What a great picture. Are you not worth much more than they? In 1997, an ecology journal published a study that they had been doing trying to discover how many birds are alive at one time on planet Earth. Now, I have no clue how they did this. I'm just simply reporting what the research showed, that they are estimated somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 billion, with a B, birds. Now, I don't know how they came to that number. It, in other words, there's a stinking lot of birds on planet Earth, okay? Most of them are in my backyard, too, and on, I think, most days. There are, whether it's that exact number or not, there are... 300 billion birds. And Jesus would say this, look, if God can feed 300 billion birds, He can take care of your family of five. If He can take care of that many birds, guess what? He can also take care of you. Are you not worth much more than they? We used to sing a song that says what? His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. That's what Jesus says here. Trust in God's ability to provide like the birds do. They know what God can do. Stop worrying and wringing your hands. He says here to trust God. He gives us a picture of birds, and then he gives us a picture of time. Look in verse 27. He asks this question, And who of you, by being worried can add a single hour to his life. Now, some of your translations say there, can add a single cubit to his stature. The Greek can be translated either way here, but the word there that he uses for cubit, a cubit is a measurement of length, like a ruler. Typically, a cubit was about 18 inches, the distance between a man's middle finger to his elbow. That's about a cubit. And so this is how they would measure things. This, this was a cubit. This was a length. And so Jesus gives us this question here, and it's as though Jesus says, imagine your life sort of chronologically. Imagine if, say, every day of your life was one foot. And from the time you were born, it was a foot, and another foot, and another foot, and another foot. And if you, if you laid it out end to end, your entire life, your, your life would be miles and miles and miles long. And Jesus said, if you look at the span of your life, how many of you, by worrying, are going to add just even a few inches to those miles? Add maybe one more hour to your life. How many of you can do that? The answer, of course, is we can't do that. In fact, medical studies show us today that people who are filled with stress and anxiety and worry are more prone to high blood pressure and stroke and heart attack, even cancer, meaning what? It will shorten your life. Jesus says, best case scenario, you break even. Worst case scenario, your life actually gets shorter from worrying. And he says here, don't do it. Time worrying is time wasted. 
He says here, you can't add any more time to your life, so don't even spend time worrying. And then he comes back and gives us another picture here. He gives us a picture thirdly here about um, wildflowers or grass. Verse 28, and why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. He says not only should you be a um, bird watcher, but you should be a grass watcher. Look out in the fields, he says. And you can imagine just even there on the Sermon on the Mount, the, the people turning to their left and their right looking at the fields and looking at the birds as he pointed to them that flew overhead. Jesus is a wonderful teacher using what they can see. And he says, look at the wildflowers. Look at how the lilies grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. When was the last time you drove past a field and saw a bunch of sewing machines running because the flowers were making clothes? I mean, it's a stupid picture, right? But that's Jesus' point. It's ridiculous. Grass doesn't, they don't, doesn't sit around using sewing machines. They don't sit around making their own clothes. In other words, God takes care of them. He says in verse 29, Not even Solomon in all of his glory clothed himself like one of these. Just watch the Discovery Channel or National Geographic and you will see the beauty and the intricacy and the design of flowers and, and, and birds and, and all these things that God has done. He is a master uh, clother in that sense. And he took care of of the grass. Verse 30, but if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is only temporary, it's alive today, you know. I mean, in the, in the worst times of the summer, you're mowing your grass two times a week. It's here for just a few hours. And if God gives your grass color, and He gives the weeds an ability to grow, if He takes care of the wildflowers in your yard, if He can do that, how much more can He do that for you? If, if there are billions of birds, guess what? There are probably trillions of wildflowers in this world, which means He can take care of us. He's telling us here to look and consider God's providence. God can clothe you. You remember in Genesis chapter 3, after Adam and Eve fell, they knew that they were naked and ashamed. And what did they do? They tried to clothe themselves, and the best they could do was a couple of fig leaves. And then God comes along in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21 and it said, And God covered them with animal skins and so God clothed them. He gave them a, a leather jacket. God provided their clothing. On their own, the best they could do is a few fig leaves. And Jesus says here, look, the Father can take care of the birds. The Father can take care of the grass. If He so feeds the birds, if He so clothes the grass, how much more can He do that for you? In other words, God has the ability. That's His point. Look at how big God is. Caring for millions of birds. Caring for billions of blades of grass. He can take care of all of them. He can take care of you. But you have to put your trust in His providence. When my children ask me at lunchtime or dinner time, Daddy, can I please have a hot dog? They are trusting in my problem. They know that they can't provide for themselves. They don't have the ability. And so they come to the one that they believe can provide for them. And God says here, and Christ says here, look, we are to rely and to depend upon the Father. To bring our needs to Him to cast our cares upon Him, knowing that He has the ability, that He has the power. Stop depending on your own power and start trusting in God's power, He says. Trust in His providence. Then notice, secondly, He tells us in this text that we should trust in God's sovereignty. In verses 31 through 33, He tells us to trust in God's sovereignty. He tells us, verse 31 again, do not worry, another command there. Do not worry then saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? I think it's interesting the way Jesus poses this in verse 31. Don't worry saying. Let's be honest, very often our worries and our anxiety comes out in our conversations. What we really believe deep down comes out when we're looking at our spouse saying, how are we going to do this? How are we going to pay for this? How are we going to take care of this? And what's coming out, are we, we think sometimes, are just conversations, but really what's coming out is unbelief. 
Jesus says, don't worry saying, guard your words, be careful of what they are revealing about your hearts. Don't worry saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what will we wear for clothing. Then verse 32, for the Gentiles eagerly seek after all these things. Now, the phrase there, that verb, eagerly seek, means to pursue. To go after. The Gentiles chase after these things. This is what their life is made up of. Going after food and drink and clothing. Now he uses the word Gentiles. Now for our purposes, when we hear the word Gentiles, we should just simply think unbelievers. That's what he's saying here. The unbelievers pursue, eagerly seek. The priority of their life is getting food and drink and clothing. And Jesus says, don't be like them. I was going to an appointment this week, a lunch meeting, and I ended up arriving early. So I walked into a little store, and there I was standing and looking at the magazine rack. And I was struck with how incredibly timeless the words of Jesus are here in this text. I spent $5.24 on a magazine that uh, it's $5.24 I'll never get back, unfortunately, because this is, this is not worth $5.25 in my opinion, but nevertheless. I saw this magazine sitting on the rack, and I was just reading the headlines there, just passing time, and I was struck with the main articles in this magazine. It's Esquire magazine, a, a men's fashion magazine. There's James Franco on the front there. If you don't know who that is, you're probably better off. Um, but there's a couple of articles that are highlighted for this magazine, and there's three of them that struck my attention. Article number one, eat like a man. Article 2, drink like a man. Article 3, dress like a man. This entire magazine made its existence by asking the question, what do we eat, what do we drink, what do we wear? Consider how timeless the words of Jesus are. Now let me make a very important point, and I want you to listen closely to this. Jesus is not insulting the unbelievers or the Gentiles. He is merely describing them. It's like saying, as birds fly and fish swim, so unbelievers chase after worldly things. He is not insulting the unbelievers, and we shouldn't either. In other words, he is not shaking his fist at Esquire magazine, how dare those unregenerate people do this. He's saying, no, that's what they do. He's not shaking his fist at them. He's pointing his finger at us and saying, and then why are you like them sometimes? Why do you so easily lose sight of what matters and this is what you go after? This is what the world does because it has nothing else. It doesn't have God. They don't have Christ. They don't have eternity. They have none of these things. And so it makes sense. That's all they have. But it doesn't make sense for you. Because you have a God who cares for you. Because you have a Heavenly Father. Because you have so much more than just food and drink and clothing. And you have to trust in God. This right here, food and drink and clothing, this is what we call worldliness. And Jesus says, no, 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 we have been called for godliness. Look at verse 33. But in contrast to the unbelievers, seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Jesus said, the world pursues worldly things, and that's what the world does. But you should not be pursuing worldly things. You are to be pursuing godly things. He says here, seek first His kingdom. Now, I always point out in this passage when I come to it, that Jesus does not say here, seek only His kingdom. Sometimes we get this notion that, well, the only way I can really please God is if I'm a pastor or a missionary. But God doesn't want everyone to become, you know, a monk or a nun. That is not the only way to please God. In fact, sometimes I, I wonder if it's not sort of antithetical to what true spirituality is. Because Jesus says it's about letting your light so shine before men. It's not about living in a monastery with the, with the trees. It's about living before men in the marketplace, in the workplace, and seeing to it that God and Christ are first and foremost. He says here, look, we all have priorities in life. We have family, we have work, 
We have our hobbies, our ambitions. We have all of these hopes and dreams, all of these priorities. Jesus said, that's fine. You need to stack those things up. You need to rank them. But you need to be sure what is at the top is God. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. See to it that, that God is first and that all the other priorities sort of follow His lead. That you have put God in the first place in all things, in your marriage, in your family, in your child rearing, in your job, in everything that you do, that God comes first. Seek first His kingdom. There are so many ways that we could apply this because there are so many ways in which we have competing pursuits, don't we? So many things in life that, that sort of wrestle and struggle with us about making priorities and putting God first. One that stands out for me in my childhood, I remember growing up and my brother and I, of course, were very involved in sports and enjoyed whatever we could get our hands on to play. And I remember as we got a little bit older, my parents sitting down and sort of talking to us and explaining, they say, look, they said, we're going to take you guys to practice, let you guys be involved in games. We're going to do all this stuff. We'll be there. We'll support you guys. You know, we think this is great. But if practice or games come on Sundays or Wednesdays, you're not going. It's not because we don't believe in sports, but it's because we really believe in Christ. And He is going to be first. And our priority. Now let's take that and let's apply that in every area of your life. Where is it that there are competing pursuits? Parents, what are we teaching our children? Well, we have to do this and have to do this and have to do this so we can't have family devotions. We can't pray together. We can't go to church. We can't do these things. And you're teaching their children that, that God is not first. He's second, third, fourth, maybe fifth. Jesus no. Seek his kingdom first. His righteousness first. Make that your greatest and highest pursuit in life. In other words, we're looking to God's sovereignty, that He is King. He can take care of us. That His rule, His reign is the most important thing to us. Jesus says, Your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. What is so great about this is the greatest and most wonderful demonstration of this came to us at Calvary. Not only does God know that we need food and drink and clothing, but even deeper than that, God knows that we need forgiveness, that we need redemption, that, that mankind has fallen. And so God started a rescue mission, sending His Son to live and die and rise again so that we, by faith in Him, might be redeemed. And He provides for us our greatest and deepest needs. My friends, if He can give you your life and your body, He can give you your food and your clothing. And even deeper than that, if, if He can give you salvation, as, as 1 Peter says, that God has granted to us everything that we need for life and godliness. And therefore, our hope is in Him. Whenever you grow anxious or worrisome, and you think about all these things that you need, turn your eyes back to the cross and be reminded of how God takes care of you. How through, from the Calvary flows the greatest and deepest solutions to our problems. He says here, seek first His kingdom, His righteousness. His righteousness comes only by faith in His Son. And it is through that righteousness that we can be called sons of God. He tells us, trust in His providence, His ability to provide. Trust in His sovereignty, seeking first His kingdom. But then thirdly and finally, He tells us to trust in God's timing. To trust in God's timing. Verse 34, He closes, by saying this, he closes this section by saying, So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus sort of closes here with a little bit of wit and wisdom. This is actually a little bit funny what he says here. He appealed to creation and redemption, and now he just appeals to sort of common sense. He said, just think about it for a moment. You've got today's worries. How are you got enough on your plate today, in other words. Why are you going to start, you know, thinking about tomorrow's plate? 
tomorrow we'll get here. And it's as though Jesus says, look, when tomorrow arrives, then you can worry about it. But guess what? Tomorrow never arrives because tomorrow is always today. As Leon Moore said in his commentary, he says, uh, as long as tomorrow is deferred, then your worry should always be deferred. It's always pushed off. He says, today's just got enough to deal with. And God knows His timing. God knows what to place before you. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Now, understand something here. Jesus doesn't say, look, if you're trusting in God, your life is going to be a picnic. It's going to be just one giant bed of roses. He admits at the end of verse 34, each day has what? Trouble. Or some versions say evil. There is sin and temptation and difficulties and obstacles that come our way. He, he admits that fact. But Jesus makes the point here of this. If God measures out your days and God measures out your trouble then guess what? God also can measure out the strength that you need for each day. Lamentation says that God's mercy and faithfulness is new every single morning. The book of Deuteronomy says, As the days of man are, so is his strength. God knows our timing. He knows our days. Don't wring your hands about tomorrow. Instead, clasp them in prayer and ask God, provide for me today my daily bread. Seek Him today. Trust His timing. His timing may not be your timing, but His timing is always perfect. He says, sir, God can measure out your days and measure out your troubles, and He can also measure out your strength. There's a sense in which, based upon verse 34, Jesus says, every day has trouble. And it's almost as though the attitude that we should adopt is, well, every day I'm going to have trouble, and any day that we don't have trouble, we just say, God, thank you for sparing me. It's like we just wake up expecting trouble, right? Each day, he says, has enough trouble. And if you have a day when you don't have trouble, then give thanks to God that He spared you from that trouble. Trust in His timing. We've all heard the story of Luke chapter 10, the story of Mary and Martha. Just listen to this. Jesus comes into the village there where Martha welcomed Him into her home. She had a sister. And Mary was sitting at the Lord's feet, it says, listening to His Word. Now I want you to hear that. But Martha, listen to this, was distracted with all her preparations. And she came to Jesus saying, my, my sister has left me to do all these things. Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things. You ever felt that way? Some of you feel that way right now today. You are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. And Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Jesus says to her, look, Mary is seeking first the kingdom of God. She's doing what she needs to do. My friend, where is it in your life that, that you're just anxious, that you're worried, that you're stressed, that's the point at which there is unbelief. And Jesus says, stop worrying so that you can start trusting. Trusting in God's providence, trusting in His sovereignty, trusting in His timing to take care of you. He has done it for us time and time and time again. And He will do it tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next. But we are to fix our eyes, to fix our hearts, to fix ourselves upon Him above everything else. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank You for this challenge. And Lord, it's not just a challenge to our actions. Lord, it, it really is a challenge to our belief system. Jesus is calling us here to greater faith in You. And so, dear Father, we ask and we pray, Lord, that You would increase our faith. 
I pray that each of us would identify those moments, those areas where we're anxious, where we're worrisome, that we lie awake at night tossing back and forth and we haven't been trusting God. And, oh Lord, may we lay our cares down at the foot of the cross. And may we reach out to You knowing that You care for us. May we be anxious for nothing but with prayer and thanksgiving make our supplications known to God. And Father, if there's anyone here today that is anxious and even worrisome about death, Lord, may they understand there is something far worse than death, but God has provided a way through His Son to be safe and saved by redemption in Jesus. May we turn with our eyes and our hearts fixed solidly upon Christ and seek Your kingdom and Your righteousness first. Thank You, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.